And actually, it occurs to me that there is, in fact, if you want to, um, uh, if you actually want to, there, if you look on the Santa Fe Institute website, so if you want to hear, there is a video of me giving a, a lecture on this black hole of finance on the Santa Fe Institute website. So I don't know what the quality is like. But a bunch of people have watched it because a bunch of people, random people from around the world, have been bothering me ever since it got posted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, this is, the, as you, you, you discovered, the danger of posting, posting your lectures on the, on the, the KO YouTube uh, side. You know. Well, what it really means is it's nice for the people who watch it, but it just means that now more people can bother you. <laughs> and yeah, since one of, one of my main goals in life is to have fewer people bother me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So because we only have uh, uh, 40 minutes, I, 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 uh, 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 <clears throat> I won't tell you about the evidence for the avian compass and for quantum smell, other than to say that it's pretty wild and the, that actually the strong evidence from the behavior of birds and the behavior of things like fruit flies that quantum mechanics is playing a role. But detailed mechanisms are not known. However, in photosynthesis, In photosynthesis, it's very clear what's going on because there's very strong spectroscopic evidence. So uh, from femtosecond spectroscopy, uh, and in particular from four-wave mixing, four-wave mixing means you put in, you put in four, four pulses, so T1, T2, T3, um, first pulse prepares the sample in some state, like gets excitonic states, excites excitons. And then there's some quantum evolution here. This is like an echo sequence. And then there's a further sequence. And then this last one allows you to measure. So at this point, you measure. This is preparation. And this is like a composite spin echo, basically. And from this, you can extract, from looking at uh, uh, the, the net source of your signal, how many photons come out, as a function of these three times, you can extract a very detailed quantum mechanical picture of the dynamics of the system. So this is femtosecond spectroscopy. These pulses are you know, a few femtoseconds long. Uh, femtosecond spectroscopy is a well-established thing. People won Nobel Prizes for it in the 90s or something like that. And so it's been around for many a year. It's a great thing. And the other evidence is, so this, this gives quantum dynamical information. And then uh, the other very useful piece of evidence is X-ray crystallography. This tells you about the detailed structure, the, you know, the physical structure of these molecules uh, that are, and molecular complexes, which are very complex, <laughs> OK? Give structural information. And from the two of these, you can get the, the net picture of this. The net result is that, essentially, from these two things together, we already have a very detailed quantum mechanical picture of how things work. We can construct full quantum mechanical picture 
of, photo, of the process of photosynthesis. I should say that not for everything, and you know, but for specific kinds of processes, you can get a very detailed quantum mechanical process. And um, uh, the result is quantum coherence in the form of things like, for instance, interference and entanglement is really important for how photosynthesis works. Quantum coherence is very important. for uh, the efficiency of photosynthesis. OK. All right, so I'm going to assume uh, uh, that people here, like me, didn't, I don't, I, you know, three and a half years ago, I knew almost nothing about photosynthesis and how it worked. So I'm going to operate under the assumption that most people here also don't know very much about how it works. And if you do know how, a lot about how it works, feel free either to fall asleep or, or you know, to, to raise your hand and say, that's not true, right? That's, that's also very fun. <laughs> I, when I actually, when I, so the, the, um, uh, it's quite funny. So this, this, um, this particular result came from these four-wave mixing experiments, the fact that the coherence is very important. It was done by the F Graham Fleming group at, at Berkeley in uh, 2008 is when it came out. And uh, no, 2007. Um, yeah, so it's three and a half years ago now. And, and uh, uh, um, uh, so I was probably the first person, along with Martin Plenio, and my colleague, Alan asper Guzik, who's actually a chemist, to start applying methods of quantum information to these photosynthetic systems. And photochemistry is a very old field. It's been around for a long time. It's not very big, but it's been around for many decades. And it's one of those fields that's inhabited by a lot of grumpy old men. You know? And you know, these are people who have nothing better to do <laughs> than, than, than to, than to you know, argue for years and years and years about which master equation to use. Right? And so I've had the experience many times now over the last three years. I'll like, say, get up, and there'll be a bunch of these grumpy old men in the audience, and I'll say something about it, and they'll say, no, that's absolutely not true. No, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out that it usually is true. It's just like a mis <laughs> miscommunication. <laughs> I was actually at one of our quantum biology meetings. I, I was joking about this with a bunch of these people in the audience. Because you know they're so grumpy, it's fun to like joke, you know, joke at their expense. And I said, yeah, this is one of those fields where, you know, uh, you know, everybody knows that, that there are fields where the only way to make progress is for people to die, right? There's this famous, <laughs> this famous, I think, I, I forget who it was, was, maybe Niels Bohr who said, you know, science progresses one death at a time. But I said, in this field, the only way to make progress on your own subject is to die yourself, right? <laughs> they didn't think it was very funny for some, I don't know, I don't know why. <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> All right. So do you also give talk on Blackboard, even in a, a photosynthesis piece I'm on? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, and I should say that the, one of the main problems about giving a talk on a Blackboard in photosynthesis is that, that um, it's actually quite helpful to have a nice picture of what's going on. And uh, in fact, if you look on Google Images for lots of the things I'm telling you about, you'll find beautiful you know, uh, 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 pictures of what these molecules actually look like. Also, in photochemistry, there seems to be a requirement that not only do you have use PowerPoint, but you actually have a movie of things, of what's happening at, at one point or another. So people put huge amounts of effort, and graduate students take years of their life to make really nice movies. So you guys should be happy that, well, I don't know, you have, do you have your graduate students making like detailed animated movies of things? Good. Yeah, you be, be, be happy. <laughs> All right, well, so people know the basic picture of photosynthesis. You know, you have some plant, or I'm going to talk a lot about photosynthetic bacteria, like uh, uh, green sulfur bacteria. So I'll use green to, uh, to draw them. <laughs> so so uh, uh, 
so you have some, this is, yeah, this is a, <laughs> this is like some, there's some green complex here, and there's like, maybe there's even some like more junk up here. This shows you. <laughs> In comes uh, a photon, a particle of light, which I'll call gamma for tradition, and this creates is absorbed in what's called a chromophore, which I'll, I'll tell you more about that later. This blobby looking thing I've described here may consist of hundreds of thousands of chromophores. Okay? It, it, it creates a, uh, an, electron hole, an electron hole pair, a so-called exciton. It's a tightly bound or Frankel exciton for people who like are, are interested in this kind of solid state stuff. And this exciton has got to make it through this big complex down to what's called the reaction center. This marker is starting to crap out. And at the reaction center is uh, the, either the, the, um, the energy in the electron and hole pair is stored uh, until several excitons can be accumulated um, to make chemical bonds, or Charge separation occurs, and the electron is stripped and hole is stripped apart, and then you can get a flow of electrical current, which you can use for the biological systems used for a variety of purposes. Okay? So, um, but that's the basic picture of photosynthesis. I didn't feel like my picture it is very, very, <laughs> very blobby. <laughs> and for a many decades, it has been actually rather mysterious about how efficient this process is. So let me just tell you what the efficiencies are. So um, uh, the, uh, the energy of the exciton is less than the energy of a chemical bond. All right? Can anybody think why it's good, it's why you don't want to have excitons with energies bigger than like a carbon-carbon bond moving some, through some big structure? Why would that be bad? See, the great thing about this quantum life is that when you find some feature, there's typically a darn good reason why things are the way they are. In fact, compared with quantum computing, it's really delightful because, you know, in quantum computing and quantum communication, we work really, really, really hard to get long coherence times and to be able to make entanglement and stuff like that. But it's always a huge struggle because the environment's always trying to get at you. But in this quantum life, it's not like that at all. It's like these, you know, uh, photosynthetic bacteria have been on Earth for more than a billion years, and as a result, they're pretty good at what they're doing. So, in fact, often very, very good at what they're doing. So all you really have to do is, uh, you know, like, look, analyze to see what they're doing, and then try to figure out how are they doing it so well. It's kind of the opposite of quantum computing. Okay. Well, if you have more than uh, the energy in, in a carbon-carbon a covalent bond, in an exciton and it's moving around in some gigantic structure, then it's going to be breaking bonds and causing damage, and that's not good. In fact, though I'm going to be talking now about energy transport in photosynthesis, a lot of the mechanisms out there in photosynthesis are there to make sure that there's not too much energy around to prevent photo damage like keratins, the things that make carrots orange and tomatoes red. Uh, those keratins are there to prevent, they're like, you know, sunblock for plants. And um, in fact, there are some bacteria uh, that, that uh, these are ones that live in hot springs in Yosemite, that don't start photosynthesizing until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Because before then, well, you know, it's just too hot. You know, no, no point in like starting work until four. <laughs> All right. So, what is in this big blobby thing right here? Okay, I'm good. In terms of time. All right. So let's uh, uh, <clears throat> let's let me let me describe the sort of smallest level of what we have here. So we have. Uh, in this purple green bacteria, we have bacterial chlorophylls, which are what are called chromophores. So chlorophyll just means, you know, green. This is green in Greek. Green leaf. Chlorophyll is what makes leaves green. And uh, why why is our leaves green? What kind of what color light do they absorb? Leaves, do you know? 
I'm sorry? Not green. Yeah, not green. They actually absorb you know, blue and purple light, and they absorb red light, but they don't absorb green light. For some reason, they don't, you know, they don't need the green light. They're using just the purple and the red light to do photosynthesis. That's why I draw, that drew this as blue. I, mean, I asked for lots of different colors so that I could <laughs> get the colors right here. So, and, and a chlorophyll is what gives leaves its color, and that's actually uh, uh, what chromophore means, color carrier. So green leaf in Greek, color carrier in Greek. That's what a chromophore means. Okay. <clears throat> And what is a bacterial, a bacterial, actually chlorophylls in general, both bacterial and plant, they, have, they look kind of like this. So I'll draw a picture of the bacterial, chlor, uh, a bacterial chromophore, bacterial chlorophyll. There's a kind of A, so this is all this kind of like blobby stuff around here. There's a little square made of only a few dozen carbon and hydrogen atoms. It's on the order of, you know, maybe like one to two angstroms in size. So it's small, right? It's not much bigger than, than uh, it's only a few atoms across. In the middle of this, there is a metal atom, such as, for instance, manganese is the typical one in bacterial chromophores. And this can donate uh, an electron to create an electron hole pair. Okay. And the electron hole pair resides in this little square right here. Now, um, this, uh, 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 <coughs> there's some very tricky quantum mechanical engineering has gone on with this. Because even though these are created in the course of a few femtoseconds, these electron hole pair, they live for a nanosecond. So they have five orders of magnitude longer lifetime than their creation time. Uh, and since you, at bottom, quantum mechanical processes are reversible, you know something pretty, pretty special must be going on to make that happen. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So then there's a bunch of other junk on the outside whose properties are no doubt related to these long lifetimes of this, uh, of this uh, uh, exciton. And then there's like a long taily like thing. <laughs> and this is used for attaching things and for making them bind together, et cetera. OK? So at the smallest level, what's going on is this. Then, so in, in actually, uh, so for example, in this green sulfur bacteria, What you have is, this is not drawn to scale, of course. Actually, of course, it's a lot smaller. <laughs> but uh, there are something like 400,000 chromophores. They're arranged in tubes. And the tubes are stacked up in this, uh, this big body that's called a chlorosome. So, there are a huge number of these things. And depending on the exact chemical composition of this tail, these rods can be completely regular, or they can be bumpy. And actually, in, in real uh, bacteria, they're kind of bumpy. They're, they look slightly irregular. This actually apparently is important to the bacteria because when people do genetic knockout experiments where they can change the gene of the bacteria and change the structure of this, they can actually make the bacteria make perfectly regular tubes. And the bacteria that have perfectly regular tubes are not as viable, and they don't reproduce as fast. And within 30 or 40 generations, they've reverted to their natural form. And I'll argue why that is in, in just a second. I mean, again, it's like you have all these. This is a very, it's a very different field from the ones I, I you know, grew up doing. And, and it, you have these complicated systems and all these various clues. And it's kind of like a detective story to try to figure out you know, who did it you know, and, and uh, how this is working. Now, uh, right here, 
I actually drew, this is much, this is definitely not drawn to scale because this right here, there are a bunch of these. these thing, this is seven, seven chromophores, seven chromophores arranged in a protein skeleton. And it's called the Fenna Matthews Olson complex, or FMO. And everybody just calls it FMO. See, this is, a, this is one of the reasons I never went into biology. It's like, there's all these different things, and they all have a name, and you're supposed to remember what the names are. And I mean, and like, the names are not obvious at all. So, <laughs> but there's nothing much to do about this. We just have to live with this. So, and, and you know, this is only seven. There are 400,000 up here. This is much smaller than this thing. There are a lot of these FMOs here. There are lots of these reaction centers. And there's a bunch of, piece of other pieces which I, which I've not put in. But as I said, if you really want to see what it looks like, go to Google Images, like and like type in Google Image FMO. You get beautiful pictures of these things. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So. Uh, uh, so you know, see you see that these things are they're hierarchical. You know, they're they're complex. They they even at the level of this chromophore. Lots of, of sneaky engineering has gone into place, as I'll describe in just a second. These structures are hierarchical. You have you know, you building blocks, which then are put together in a, a variety of other much, much, much bigger structures. And then you have this, the reaction center, which is quite a complicated place, you know, because you, it actually takes four excitons to make a carbon-carbon bond because the energy of the exciton is slightly less than a carbon-carbon bond, but uh, uh, you need four of them to build one when you're actually you know, building new molecules, because it's a kind of wasteful process. In fact, let me just write down the efficiencies for this process for these bacteria. This, these are basically common kinds of efficiencies for all these things. So the absorption, let's first look at absorption. Now, we know that absorption can't be that efficient because we want to, you're, you're absorbing light, which actually does have enough energy to break bonds, and you're turning it into something which doesn't. So if you look at the absorption spectrum, then here, is, here it is in terms of, I don't know, h bar omega. So, it, they typically look something like this. And this is the exciton energy. The rest of this energy is when, when it's absorbed, you create the uh, sorry exciton energy uh, in ground state of chromophore, I should say. So what happens here in this chromophore is the light comes in, it creates this electron hole pair, and then, but it's got a lot of vibrational and you know, orbital energy within here, and it's like thrashing around, and this, this molecule is like, you know, ba everything's bouncing around, and then this, this gets absorbed as heat, and it, it gradually calms down, and the electron hole pair relaxes to the ground state of the exciton in this uh, chromophore. And I think actually, so I think that the original, they, they, there are two different axes. One is, say it's originally like that, and then it relaxes to an axis that's something like this. This is actually kind of important, right? Because remember, as I said before, quantum mechanically, everything is reversible. So if you got absorbed, you know, you want to have a really, you want to have a broad bandwidth for absorption. And uh, uh, you want it to be a fast process, which goes together, right? You want it, so absorption should be a broad bandwidth fast process. So you can absorb as much light as possible. And so you, you know, you're strongly coupled to the electromagnetic field. But if you're in such a state, then that's very bad for exciton lifetime. Because if, you know, if it's a broad bandwidth transition and you're strongly coupled to the electromagnetic field, then you can emit energy just as well. So what actually happens is, this is the ground state. So you get absorbed along this axis, and then it relaxes over here, and now it's in a very long-lived state. So presumably, a bunch of this other junk that's over here um, 
is related to maybe this stuff over here is related to the uh, dipole moment for absorption. Okay, and this stuff over here is related to you know, trying to suppress the dipole moment for emission. So it's a sneaky process. And indeed, when they do these knockout experiments and they alter these things here, again, you find that when you change these bacteria, these pieces of bacteria, they're either not as good at absorbing light or they're unha less happy than ordinary bacteria and they reproduce more slowly and they, you revert to the uh, the natural state within, again, 30 or 40 generations. So something has been optimized for these, these systems. Oh, another neat thing about this is that the electron and hole are in a singlet state, a spin singlet. So they're in the state up, down, minus, down, up. Now, what this means is this is kind of a sneaky trick, right? Because it means that they cannot, even if their wave functions overlap, and you know, pretty clearly these, chrom these chromophores are doing a very good job of segregating, keeping the electron and the hole away from each other. So their wave functions don't overlap very much. But even if they do overlap, they can't form a photon because they have angular momentum zero and the photon has angular momentum one. So the only way they can form a photon is by a nonlinear two-step process or nonlinear process where they both, you know, they, they create a photon and a phonon. But they're already, you know, in their vibrational, close to their vibrational ground state. Or they absorb a phonon, but there's not that many phonons around. So this is, uh, gives you symmetry suppressed. How come there aren't so many phonons around, even though it's a random Ah, because um, uh, if you look at uh, the, actually this is a good question, I don't know exactly what the vibrational energies of these things are, but I'm pretty sure that the vibrational energies inside, uh, so? yeah, the, the, no, the vibrational energies, uh, they correspond, I mean, there are phonons around, that's true. But, but the, it's not clear that the electron and the whole pair are actually vibrating around. It's this other stuff that's vibrating around. So even, I mean, there are phonons around. Yeah, I was exaggerating. Of course, there are, there are phonons around. But um, they may not be interacting very strongly with this electron whole pair. Okay. So symmetry, suppressed, uh, uh, symmetry suppresses emission. As you say, there are going to be phonons around, so it won't keep it around forever. But it keeps it around for a nanosecond or two, which turns out to be plenty long enough to actually get it where it's going. Just making sure I'm on schedule here. And this, by the way, so, so again, in, in understanding how this photosynthesis works, I find it quite useful. I mean, these systems are so complicated and huge, and you know, there, there are, are hundreds of thousands or millions of, uh, in this case, millions and millions of atoms and uh, this or tens of millions of atoms in this whole apparatus. And in order to understand what's going on, uh, I think it's, Im it's important to kind of see the symmetries when, when they're there. And actually, in a lot of other, I mean, so this, uh, these chromophores up here, they have some kind of funny symmetrical structure, but it's not quite symmetrical. And later on, I'm going to argue in, in another kinds of photocomplexes that nature is using symmetries at this m most microscopic scale to make things live for a long time. But then if you put things together in a symmetric fashion at a higher scale, then the symmetries at the higher scale can actually do things like enhance transport. So nature is, in fact, um, doing something that in quantum information we only discovered you know, in the last 15 years, which is using a kind of coding. You know, coding is the representation of the energy in these molecules. But codes are good for something, codes are good for some things, and some codes are good for other things. So here, this is this kind of spin singlet coding. This is a so-called decoherence-free subspace, or in this case, it's kind of a, an emission-free subspace. Um, and then, 
at a higher level, they can, they'll use, they'll, I'll argue that nature will use things like uh, symmetrized states to enhance transport. And this is a concatenated quantum code. I mean, this is really fancy stuff. You know, when you have, you use a concatenated code because one level of the coding does one thing for you and the other level of the coding does another thing for you. And when you put them together, you have something that does, you know, both of the things that you want. You know, Seth, very often when we talk about external qubit, we talk about ground state and first excited state being zero and one qubits. Yeah. Right? And then, you know, four-way mixing allows you to find, for example, coherence. Right. And T1 is just, you know, typical transition time from the excited state to the ground state. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And here you're talking about nanosecond being... T1. T1, but I thought you're, this is lifetime of electron exciton. Oh, the, yes, it's a lifetime of the exciton. So if the exciton electron whole pair recombine, they, they emit a photon or, or a bunch of heat into the molecule, and the exciton is gone. So if you're calling that state 1, then the, it's the 1 to 0 relaxation. And the state with no exciton, 0, then, then it would be that. Of course, there are a lot more states here. Then how do you, how do you define coherence? Phase I haven't I haven't talked about phase right, coherence right, yet. Okay. I mean, the singlet, of course, has right, has right, phase right. coherence in the in the singlet state, but it's just in this case, it's just induced right. by right. relaxation. Right. Right. And it takes less than nanosecond for 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 the uh, exon to move from the top part to the uh, reaction. Section. Yeah, exactly. So um, uh, uh, this process right here, it, this is going to take. Tens of this, this, this is a sort of around 10 femtosecond time scale. This hopping process right here, the transport process, all these processes are on the kind of like 1 to 10 picosecond time scale. Now, this, so this is sort of, you know, this process right here can be, can be like, you know, 70 to 80 percent or more efficient, maybe more. It just depends on the bandwidth right here. Actually, I mean, you know, being in this case, and some saying efficient is somewhat misleading because you're less efficient if you have a broader bandwidth. So you're less efficient at, at, at storing the energy in the exciton, but of course you're being more efficient at capturing the energy. So um, this process is 99% efficient or more, this transport process in these bacteria, also in green plants, which have a different kind of structure. This almost essentially 100% efficiency, once the exciton is located, gets into the whole photosystem, almost 100% of the time it gets to the reaction center. Okay? I'm just going to mention that this, the process of the efficiency of turning that energy into chemical energy is like 3%, 3 to 6% efficient, typically more like 3% efficient. So only you know, less than 5% of the energy on average that actually gets captured and makes it to the reaction center gets turned into chemical energy. This, by the way, this, this 3 per 6 percent efficiency shows that we should be very careful if we think, we should think twice about whether we're going to be able to um, solve our energy problems by using biofuels. Because even your cheapest, lousiest solar cell that, you know, you runs your, your 100 yen calculator, <laughs> right? <laughs> even those 100 yen calculator solar cells, which are the, obviously the cheapest one you can possibly get, those are still like 10 or 12% efficient. And you can get, you know, fancier solar cells are 20% efficient that you can buy right now. And you can, you know, make really fancy solar cells in the laboratory that are 40% efficient. So this is a lot less efficient than way of constructing energy than you know, using, using solar power directly. But this right here is pretty remarkable. And uh, uh, for many decades, people have not understood it very well. You know, it's actually, if you look at the dynamics of this using semi-classical or non-quantum mechanical models, it's hard to understand how it can be that efficient. And I'm going to give an explanation for that. And I, I want to make sure I stay on schedule. I'm, I'm OK. I'm on schedule. <laughs> so 
So, all right. So now, what uh, what did Fleming show here? There are these seven chromophores here, and using this four-wave mixing, he showed that there was coherent tunneling back and forth between two of these chromophores. So the, you can you can this four-wave mixing allows you, and this three-dimensional spectroscopy allows you basically to see peaks in your spectrum that correspond to the existence of quantum coherence. And the height of these peaks tells you, you know, how coherent it is and how long it lasts for. And also, of course, by varying these times, you can tell how long it lasts for. And so Fleming showed at liquid nitrogen temperature that you could get coherent tunneling of an exciton back and forth here. And more recently, Greg Engel at University of Chicago and Greg Scholes at University of Toronto have shown this coherence at room temperature. So there's definite coherence in terms of this hopping back and forth. And that actually means that when you model this, you can't just model this exciton moving through this FMO complex as kind of just a classical hopping process. Because when you take different paths through this complex, then they interfere with each other. So <clears throat> let me just, uh, uh, I think I can get rid of this right now. Coherence in this hopping process, you know, ton basically tunneling is taking place, implies that the exciton is not taking some kind of classical random walk through this process. It's taking a quantum walk. In which these different paths interfere with each other. Now, of course, it's kind of, you know, it's still not completely coherent, but it's not incoherent either. And in fact, I'm going to argue in just a second that what's going on is that these bacteria have found a really sneaky and you know, finely tuned way of, of uh, handling the interplay between coherence coming of the underlying process and decoherence that comes from the environment. But before I say that, let me note that so the reason I got into this whole topic was uh, uh, you know, we have a pretty large group of people doing quantum information at MIT. There's like 14 faculty who are doing it most, almost full time. And about half of them are theory and half are experiment. And uh, we have a weekly theory group meeting in which we discuss you know, interesting events that have arisen and you know, good, or there are interesting papers on the archive and stuff like that. And if something's sufficiently interesting, then somebody gets assigned to go figure out what's going on and then report at the next meeting what happened. So at this meeting, which was uh, uh, you know, about three years ago, maybe a little, little more, uh, uh, somebody said, hey, did you see in the New York Times this morning that uh, green sulfur bacteria are performing quantum computation? <laughs> so. In the New York Times, it claimed that these bacteria were performing Grover quantum search, and that this paper claimed it, speculated that might be true too. That essentially, in order to, for the exciton to find its way from here down to there, it was performing a quantum search algorithm. And the reason that this process was so efficient is that you know it was searching out the reaction center and getting there by that process. Now, we all thought that was really, really funny. Everybody just like, laughed and laughed and laughed. This is actually, which is a normal thing for our group meetings. It's like at one point, at one point during the meeting, everybody has to burst into laughter. Uh, so, but um, uh, 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 Alan Asper Guzik, who was then an assistant professor of chemistry at Harvard, and I got assigned to go take a look at this. Uh, and we found that they were not doing a quantum search operation because, you know, for those of you familiar with quantum algorithms and even the continuous version of quantum algorithms, quantum search is a very specific process. You know, all the states have the same energy except this one state that has a different energy. And then you have to apply two Hamiltonians that don't commute with each other. And it really wasn't going on here. I mean, because actually the Hamiltonian for the system is, is well known. On the other hand, we realized right away, basically, that 
this quantum walk feature was happening. So a quantum walk is just simply a coherent hopping process where the paths interfere with each other, and it's known uh, for a long time now from work of Farhi Goldstone and Guppmann that, that quantum computers can solve all kinds of hard problems faster than classical computers by this quantum walk. And in particular, this bacteria has solved the problem of getting the, X, the energy efficiently from point A to point B using a quantum walk. And this quantum walk is much more efficient than a classical walk would be. Okay, so the bacteria are indeed doing a kind of quantum computation. So let me tell you what we did. We, uh, uh, the, the Hamiltonian for the system is no. So let's, let me use a notation, as you were suggesting, that, that zero is uh, exciton, no exciton in a chromophore, and one is there's an exciton in the chromophore. So then I can write this Hamiltonian as um, h bar over 2, sum over j for the different chromophores. Oh, and I also need one. I need, um, I need uh, one for the reaction center as well. Uh, omega sub j, sigma uh, uh, z sub j. Right? So this, is, this says, OK, you know, if the exciton is in this chromophore, then there's, it's got a particular energy, omega j. I guess I better make that minus in that case. <laughs> Why, what is it in I thought it was like 7 or 8. This is, oh, excuse me, you're right. What, the, what, what did I do? I think that was an 8 sideways. <laughs> I'm just, that's, oh yeah, I guess I'm so used to making things go from 1 to infinity, I, I very rarely write down the sum of things going from 1 to 8. So I meant it to be an 8. <laughs> OK, these omegas are all known to a high degree of accuracy from the spectroscopic data. OK? Uh, but then there's a hopping Hamilton turn, turn, hopping term. So something that takes a, a uh, exciton that's on the jth chromophore and hops it over to destroys it there and creates it at the ith chromophore. Plus, of course, it's Hermitian conjugate. <coughs> And then there's an interaction with the environment. And the, the environment is a set of phonons coupled to these different chromophores. You can either, they, there's a common, because they're embedded in a protein skeleton. Now, remember that the actual spatial structure and the chemical structure, the way these things are put together, is quite well known. So um, you know, from x-ray spectroscopy, from, excuse me, from, yeah, from the x-ray crystal, uh, crystallography, data. And so by combining, what people do is they, do, they take both the spectroscopy and the, the structure information, and they do a kind of best fit for the structure of the system to get a very accurate picture of what, how the thing is going. They also know things about the spectrum of phonons in this vibrational environment. So what Alan asper Guzik and his postdocs and graduate students and I did is we, we took this Hamiltonian plus the interaction with the environment, and then we constructed a master equation. You know, d rho dt is equal to some uh, uh, operator L acting on rho. OK, I'll make sure it looks like a rho, not an e. So. Um, so it's just the, you know, the time, it's the time evolution of this open quantum system for the exciton hopping through there. Now, all of the parameters of the Hamiltonians and the couplings to the environment are actually known. So we use no free parameters in this master equation. The only thing you actually can do is to vary the temperature. Because, of course, even with, given this master equation, you can have environments that have a different temperature. And we looked at the behavior of transport through this FMO as a function of temperature. Now you see how nice this is for folks like me and for folks like people here in this room because you know I may not know very much about photosynthesis, though actually know, now I know more about it than I did. But if you give me a Hamiltonian like this and I know how to make a master equation, that's something I do know how to do. <laughs> right? 
of course, uh, as I was saying, the, um, when you present this to um, the photochemists, they say, why are you using that master equation? You should use a, you should use a non-Markovian master equation. Right? You know, they, they like to argue about stuff like that. Uh, and indeed, it probably makes a bit of difference. But it's not going to make much difference. So <clears throat> let me tell you what happens now. OK, what happens is the following. So let me, uh, let's draw a diagram as a function of temperature. And let's look at efficiency as a function of temperature. Now, before we actually simulated this, I actually had some predictions for this system as to what this would look like. I'm just saying this because you know, I did not, most of the work in this project was done by Alan's postdocs and graduate students who actually, you know, put the master equation into the computer and then did the hard work of simulating it. it, it but it took a while, but it well, didn't take that long. However, you know, I helped out with trying to construct the stuff. And also, I made the following predictions, which turned out to be correct. So at low temperature, at zero temperature in particular, we don't, the environment, we don't have to worry about the environment, except for zero point fluctuations, which aren't that important. And this is almost completely coherent process. Now, if you look at these omegas and these j's, what you find is that delta omega, the typical size of an energy difference, is on the same order as the typical size of a j. Okay. The system is disordered. And that means because of this mismatch in the omegas, and because the j's are not much bigger than the delta omegas, then you expect the system to be localized. It should undergo Anderson localization, which comes simply from the fact that if you look at these different paths as they move through the system, that the paths tend to have random phases, and they tend to interfere destructively, because stuff with random phases interfere destructively. Now, I should mention that in solid state, there's some, there's, there's debate about whether small, relatively small systems like this can exhibit Anderson localization. But I went and described this problem to Anderson himself in Princeton. I said, is this Anderson localization? He said, of course, this is Anderson localization. So <laughs> admittedly, you know, what, 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 what <laughs> that doesn't mean that other people would call it Anderson localization. <laughs> so and indeed, what happens is the efficiency starts off at around. Is Tom only nearest neighbors? I'm sorry? No, well, these couplings are mean, it's mediated by the induced dipole, but by the dipole moments, right? And um, uh, so it's certainly stronger for the nearest neighbors. These guys are in some funny three-dimensional shape, so things tend to have more than a couple. I mean, I do it in a two-dimensional fashion, but you know, there are stronger couplings and weaker couplings. OK, so now let me point out that point 0.7 Efficiency of 0.7 means quite strong, means that's very strongly localized. Because these hopping events take place on the order of like the couplings are like 1 to 5 picoseconds. Uh, and, um, uh, so, and the lifetime is a nanosecond. So it has hundreds, can do hundreds of steps. And yet, in, in only 30% of the time does it make it down to the reaction center. So that means strongly localized. You know, you start it with the wave function up here, and the wave function only ends up getting a teeny piece, a pretty small piece down here. Now, as you add noise, let's just think of decoherence. So one thing that pe people in this field have, they usually thought, oh, it's just about energetics, right? It's about this, you need the phonons can give energy to these systems, or they can take it away. And we can think of this as a relaxation process, because these things, this goes ever so slightly downhill in terms of energy. I mean, not much, by about much less than KT, for instance. But it goes slightly downhill. So, but what we were interested in is actually is in decoherence. So dephasing, which is just these you know, energy levels jiggling up and down with respect to each other. Now you can see what happens if these energy levels jiggle up and down with respect to each other, that um, 
uh, they're going to start matching up. If, even if they're mismatched to begin with, they're going to start matching up. And when this happens, then you can tunnel back and forth. So at a decoherence time, where the uh, where the decoherence time is on the same order as uh, delta omega, then you should expect this localization to start to be destroyed. And that's indeed what happens. So this goes up to an efficiency of 1. And it stays there for many decades of temperature, for a very broad range of temperature. OK. However, if you decohere things too much, then this is like actually measuring the system really fast. You know, you're defacing the system. Defacing can be thought of, you know, I measure it again and again and again really, really fast. And you know then, if you measure a system really fast, the so-called watchdog effect kicks in. And because you're measuring it so fast, or because it's decohering so fast, no coherent phase, sorry, no coherent amplitude, or the coherent amplitude that manages to propagate from one place to another to build up, just doesn't have time to build up, and you'll start to suppress transport. And indeed, that's exactly what you see. And then this plunges down basically to zero at very high temperatures. But temperatures that are, you know, would, would involve basically, you know, these bacteria live in hot spring ocean vents at the uh, base of the ocean, but, um, you know, they're not, they're not uh, being fried. You know, so, OK. So the, uh, uh, an even more um, extreme number, oh, that's not a very good pen. black is the time to traverse the FMO, the time it takes to get across. Now this time starts out at around uh, 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 90 picoseconds at the, the, the excitons that actually make it through the FMO and gets absorbed, it takes them about 90 picoseconds to do that at zero temperature. As the destructive interference gets absorbed, this goes down, 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 down. And then it reaches a minimum, which is 5 picoseconds. And then it scoots up to infinity, because if you don't make it to the, if you never make it to the reaction center, then it's taking you an infinite amount of time to do it. Actually, you know, the largest, largest it can be is a nanosecond, because at that point, the exciton just goes away. Now, <clears throat> So in here, 5 picoseconds means this thing is just scooting through this FMO. You know, it starts up here and whoosh, there's sufficient interference, positive interference between these paths for it to make it down there in a very rapid time. Way, way faster than it really needs to. But this just shows you why this is a 100%, um, basically 100% efficient process. So basically, you're saying that at a certain temperature, all the levels are quite matched. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, if you can think, if you think of, you know, just a, a, a crude semi-classical picture of decoherence, is that these levels are they start out unmatched, right. right, and then they start to jiggle around, and then they jiggle around enough so that they have really significant overlap. overlap yeah. Right. Yeah. And at that point, so that's that's the point when. That is expressed in terms of the times, that's when one of the decoherence time is roughly delta omega. And the j's are already in this range as well. Presumably, these j's are the things, you know, you can, nature can, can by natural selection, can change these delta omegas. But the j's are kind of, can't really be changed that much because these um, chromophores can't be too close to each other because if they're too close, you get what's called quenching which is the wave functions of the electrons and holes in the two chromophores start overlapping. And then uh, the electron and hole pair will go away really rapidly. So they should be, you know, they should be uh, uh, a, uh, a few angstroms apart, these, uh, these chromophores. If they get any closer, then, then the, the whole process goes away. So there's the, probably the, the environmental limit comes from these J's, these couplings. And you see an interesting thing, which is that, that 
you get convergence of time scales. And you see why you get convergence of time scales, too. Because what happens is if, if, these, you know, if, if these time scales are very different, then you know, if the decoherence time is much shorter or longer than, let's say, say it's much longer than these other things, then it's just some weak perturbation and it has very little effect. If it's much shorter, then it completely dominates the dynamics and nothing happens. But when it's roughly of the same order, then these processes can either help each other out or hurt each other. They can affect each other, essentially. And strangely enough, in these biological systems, they often, they usually end up helping each other out. Similarly for the delta omegas, you know, lo localization takes place. If delta omega is much bigger than J, then the thing is completely stuck just by energy conservation. But once delta omega gets to be roughly the same size as J, then you can start having transport. If delta omega becomes much smaller than, than J, well, there's not really much point in doing this. You're going to be localized anyway, and uh, uh, you're interacting with this decohering environment. So you know, probably what happened is these J's are fixed kind of by the laws of physics. And then nature engineered these delta omegas and these decoherence times so that they were at roughly the same level. Now, I'll let you guess what is this critical temperature where these things are you know, maximum efficiency, minimum transport time. Room temperature. Yeah, that's 290, 290 Kelvin, which uh, shows you that uh, <laughs> either, you know, depending on your religious persuasion, like <laughs> either God, that, that God, she is one great quantum mechanical engineer. You know, she really knows what she's up to when she's designing these things. Or you could also say that gajillions of bacteria did not die in vain, right? No. So, yeah, so these things are highly optimized. Moreover, they're robust because, in fact, they, they maintain their essentially 100% efficiency uh, over, over many tens of degrees, many tens of degrees, maybe hundreds of degrees, probably. And you can kind of see why that would be. I mean, you know, if you're a green sulfur breathing bacteria living at a a you know, hot water vent, a hot sulfur volcanic vent or on the ocean floor hundreds of meters below the ocean surface, a photon comes along every you know, half an hour or something like that. It's like, so it's like, oh, oh I caught a photon, finally, you know, the children can eat. It's like, oh, oh, shoot, I dropped the exoton. Oh, you fool, you dropped the exoton. The children will starve, you know. So just for marital relations between between bacteria, it's very important. And um, there's strong evolutionary pressure is not to drop the excitons. Uh, <laughs> OK, so that's a, uh, oh, I'm, I'm pretty much out of time. But let me just say, um, let me just say one more system. So, so this is the first thing that we did along this. We, we said, ah, you know, OK, let's like apply the things we need to know how to do this open system quantum stuff, ideas of quantum information. Let's apply it to these complicated excitonic systems. So the next thing I'll just mention briefly uh, 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 what I just described. Let's see, I need a purple marker for this, because what I'm going to describe are purple sulfur bacteria. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> let me draw a picture of these things. You would have to take red to be purple here, even though red, of course, is on the wrong end of spectrum for purple. So uh, purple bacteria. In purple bacteria, uh, uh, here is the reaction center. The, most of the stuff are these rings that sit in a membrane. They're actually double rings. One ring has 18 chromophores that absorb and emit at a wavelength of roughly 850 nanometers. The other ring has nine. at 800 nanometers. And then there are a lot of these rings. And then the reaction center is surrounded by a bigger ring with uh, 36 at 850, another double ring, and 18 at 800. And the reaction center is located in the middle of this. This is called 
LH1, light harvesting complex 1, and these things are called light harvesting complex 2. And so here, you know, the, the, the exciton shows up. This will be, let's have it be green light this time. Uh, because it does absorb green light. <laughs> right, that's why it's purple. <laughs> Exciton shows up, and it's got to make its way through these rings to the LH1. And then when it's in the LH1, it can be popped at the reaction center. Crazy stuff. I mean, and these things are arranged. The rings themselves are quite regular. Uh, uh, you know, each one has exactly this number of chromophores. But um, they're arranged in a slightly irregular looking way around the LH2. Again, millions of atoms in these, these things. So now, remember that, that uh, I, I was arguing that the chromophore itself, I shouldn't have erased it, the chromophore itself with its electron hole pair in a singlet, that the singlet part of this, together with the uh, the isolation of the hole and the electron from each other is responsible for this long lifetime. And presumably, suppression of the dipole moment along this axis. All kinds of engineering, quantum engineering, has gone into this. So, so there's a symmetry at the, at, the, at the microscopic scale. Symmetry suppressed emission. So symmetry and other stuff suppresses emission. What are these circular structures for? Why, why, why that? You know, <laughs> presumably there's some reason. Okay, and let me tell you what 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 we think it is. So, if I have one, let's take one of these LH2. Let me draw it. Let me draw it over here. And let me draw it bigger than the others. Even though it's not bigger, it's just because I want to just make it bigger looking. Okay. okay. So first of all, why a double ring? Well, that broadens the absorption bandwidth. You know, if you absorb at this higher energy, 800 nanometers, a shorter wavelength, then uh, uh, the exciton will relax to this 850 nanometer line. And so you have a broader band that goes essentially from you know, 800 to 850. And then actually, they're pretty broad bands already, because they, they, they span that whole bunch and a bunch more. So they, they span like 100 nanometers in terms of their bandwidth, which is good. So they have a broad bandwidth for absorption. Now, <clears throat> let me draw a few of the couple of these guys right here. So I claim that these rings are there to exploit another kind of symmetry. The ground state of the exciton of this ring is delocalized over the whole ring. It's a symmetrized state on the whole ring. Right? I mean, if you actually, the nice thing about these ring like structures is that they're pretty easy to analyze. Again, it's like, you know, I know what the Hamiltonian is for something hopping around in a ring. It's got this quadratic form. The lowest energy state is the ground state. The next lowest uh, is the fully symmetric state. The next lowest energy state has wave functions for propagating around the ring that looks like that. And then there's one that has three nodes, et cetera. This is stuff I can do, right? One dimensional quantum mechanics with periodic boundary conditions. What could be nicer than that, right? <clears throat> so, but you have, there's a neat feature, which is if I have the symmetrized state of one ring, and suppose it's coupled symmetrically, so suppose there, this is not true, of course, these things are broken, but suppose it were that all these excitons were coupled, sorry, excuse me, all these chromophores were coupled symmetrically to all the chromophores on this ring. And let's say that the chromophore to chromophore coupling is gamma. Now you can ask, well, then what is the coupling rate of this symmetrized state here to this symmetrized state here? That is, how long would it take the state to hop, the symmetrized state to hop from this set to here? Well, you'd ordinarily say, oh, OK, this, I've got a chromophore localized here. There are n chromophores here. The kind of semi-classical thing would see n gamma, so semi-classical. But quantum mechanically, because these are in symmetrized states, all these dipole moments of these things are oscillating coherently. They add up coherently, and you get n squared gamma for the quantum case. This is what's called uh, supertransport. 
it's the um, it's the transport equivalent of super radiance. People who do quantum optics are very familiar with this phenomenon of super radiance. If you take a bunch, a single excitation that's in a symmetrized state of n atoms, the emission rate goes as n times the single emission rate. Here, you have a single excitation that spreads symmetrically amongst n chromophores, and the transport rate is n times the incoherent transport rate. Now, if you actually look at what happens at room temperature, these things are delocalized over about a third of this ring because some of the higher states are occupied. And, uh, but what happens then is you can, if you imagine here, it moves over here, this thing gets transported around the ring. It goes to over here. Now it's quite symmetrically coupled to this other stuff over here. So this whole blob can just hop symmetrically from one ring to another. And so the picture that you have here that what, of what actually is happening is, you know, you start with here's the excitonic, delocalized excitonic state. It propagates around the ring. As it comes close to other rings, it's got something which is not, you know, 18 times as likely to hop from one place to another, but it could easily be five times as likely. It moves over here, you know, propagates over here, hops to this other guy right here. So this this blob is this excitonic, delocalized excitonic state is now taking now largely from ring to ring a probably more incoherent hop, but it actually could be reasonably coherent as well. We don't know for sure. And as it moves it through this LH2 complex to make it to the LH1. And this gives it a, uh, a, a very, uh, uh, it gives it a very efficient transport. Once again, it's 100% efficient. And you see that you have at the microscopic level, symmetry is used, being used to, uh, uh, to keep the exciton alive for a long time. But at the sort of mesoscopic level, not that you can see these things under a microscope, they're still too small, then you have symmetry enhanced transport. And you put these two things together, and what you see is you basically have what we would recognize as a concatenated quantum code. Two levels of coding. The microscopic level is to keep, designed to keep things alive for a long time. The mesoscopic level is designed to make things move fast. Pretty fancy. So. For years, I'll just close by saying that for years, every now and then when I give talks about building quantum computers, somebody in the audience, never always a man, never a woman, I don't know why, but always a man, would say, you can't build quantum computers because if you could, nature would already have evolved them, right? Which is a really stupid argument. That's like sort of saying, you can't build a semiconductor laser because if you could, nature would already have evolved one. <laughs> well, of course, you know, nature evolved human beings, and human beings were all natural people, you know, and we built the human beings, figured out semiconductors, lasers, so, lasers, so you know, you could figure out, yeah, maybe nature did evolve semiconductor lasers. But actually, in the case of sneaky quantum information processing techniques, nature did evolve these. They evolved, nature evolved quantum logs, which is, in fact, a quantum algorithm. In this case, these environmentally assisted quantum logs. And this happened sometime on the order of hundreds of millions of years ago, because these bacteria have been around for more than a billion years. So uh, now I can actually say, yeah, well, actually, nature did evolve this. So, so, so there. <laughs> OK. I, I should stop there with time because it's time for lunch okay. and for questions. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks, Beth. Uh, any further questions? <clears throat> yeah, you want to you want to turn in your uh, turn in your your solid state NMR quantum computers for uh, bacterial quantum computers. <laughs> we'll see. How Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is the graffiti of the uh, graffiti of the mechanics uh, exists in the photosynthesis process. What I mean is when uh, there is the absorption of a photon. Yeah. 
by the system. It's not possible to to detect the mechanical effect due to the absorption of the problem. Well, that might be hard. I mean, there, there certainly is a mechanical effect. Like, in, as I was arguing, inside these chromophores, right, you're creating an electron hole pair, an exciton, in a pretty confined space, and it's exerting very significant uh, 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 forces on this, the, well, you know, on this molecular structure. Indeed, it's actually absorbed as a singlet, so it's absorbed in a state, in a singlet state, and the, the chromophore itself is picking up the extra quantum of angular momentum, and there's lots of, so, lots of stretching and oozing goes on in these systems, and then there's this rapid relaxation. I don't know how much is known about that. Um, you know, they know that it happens. They know the time scales involved, 10 femtoseconds or so. But um, I mean, it's a pretty complicated process and be hard to simulate. So, but it certainly it does involve chemical, and and uh, uh, it involves involves these chemical forces. That's how the um, that's how the uh, chromophore absorbs the excess energy that's in the um, initial exciton as the exciton falls down to its ground state.